business is to elect an acting chair. I'd like to nominate Carol Ann Jordan as acting chair for the evening. And motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Should I oppose them? <laughs> First order of business, or second order of business, is the minutes of the previous meeting. Does anybody have any changes or questions? I don't have any specific changes, but, um, and I don't really know the right way to go about it. But um, in the comments, I have to get, I just thought perhaps for the record, in case there is an appeal, um, of the Inn by the Sea on page number four at the top where um, Ray Nouveau was, um, his, you know, his comments are summarized. I just, re I recall him saying that, you know, he was worried that this building would set a precedent and as the applicant were to go about um, tearing down and rebuilding other buildings on the site that they would follow in the vein of this new building, which was out of character with the existing buildings. And it was a pretty lengthy comment. But I thought to the extent that what, given what we've learned about the need to have standing and being a grie an aggrieved party, I thought maybe adding some of those notations might indicate that he was indeed potentially aggrieved. I, what are you, Victoria, I see you shaking your head. I recall the comments, so I agree that I heard the same comments. You heard those same comments, yeah. Yes. But I don't know how to go about changing the minutes to include those. Right. Our person who does is over there being a technical support person. <laughs> um, and I'm on record so I can talk at least. Um, if there is a section of the minutes that you would like to have expanded, I would look to our minute secretary and ask her if she thinks that she could listen to the tape again and expand that section and then bring back a revised set of minutes next month. Okay. Um, is that something you think you do you feel comfortable understanding what her concern was that I do. Um, what, I, what I said in the minutes is that he said it doesn't look like a cottage or the other cottages he expects they will probably change the other ones too. Okay, right. Um, if you want more than that, I will go back to the table and yeah. see if I can give you more than that. Right. That would be great, just only because of the potential sensitivity of it, of the grade problem. Um, I have no problem with that. Thank you. Any other comments? So uh, I guess we would want a motion to table these acceptance of these minutes to the, the next meeting. Would that be? Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Is there a motion? All right. I'd like to make a motion to um, table the acceptance of these minutes until the next scheduled planning board meeting. And I'll second that. Second. All those in favor? Okay, everyone's in favor, no one opposed, all set. Power <coughs> resource protection permit. Um, Colin Powers and Owen, is that how you pronounce it? LLC are requesting a resource protection permit to fill 669 square feet of wetland to accommodate construction of a single family home located at Sunrise Drive and Lighthouse Point Road. And they have asked that this, their application be tabled until the January meeting. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Or does, um, I'd like to make a motion to table the uh, request for the applicant to the January 17th meeting. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? No, no one's opposed? All right. Moving on, 
Next item on the agenda is uh, 517 Ocean House Road, LLC, requesting site plan review <coughs> and resource protection permit to construct an 80-seat restaurant and second 1,250-square-foot retail building, including 2,738 square feet of wetland alteration to construct a sidewalk in the Business A District located at 517 Ocean House Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance. And the first order of business is a presentation by the applicant. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my name is Patrick Carroll. I'm with. Uh, is this, can you turn this mic down a little bit? Or no? Okay. <clears throat> my name is Pat Carroll. I'm with uh, Carroll Associates, and we're here representing Paul Woods and 517 Ocean House LLC on on this application tonight. Um, as you know, we met back in November at a, uh, at a workshop, or actually it was a preliminary hearing uh, for completeness, and um, I think rather than just going through the whole uh, project again tonight, I'd like to just touch on kind of the, the uh, revisions and changes that have been made since then, and then talk a little bit about some of the staff and uh, staff review comments that have come forward, and also talk a little bit about some of the comments from from neighbors that have come forward. So I'm, um, with me tonight is Allie Welch, and um, Phil Kaplan is in the back. Phil is the architect on this. And when I'm done talking about the site, I'm gonna turn it over to Phil, and he's brought some samples of siding for you. He's got some, some great kind of 3D uh, modeling of the, of the buildings. And I think you're gonna find that uh, this is a pretty exciting project and a pretty great thing for uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> um, first thing that we that we modified, and I, a lot of this is outlined in the letter dated, uh, I think it's December 2nd, that uh, went with the revised application. Um, we have, currently there's an existing sewer line that runs right through, actually right now it's right through the middle of the parking lot here, uh, that we have to relocate. And so we've been working with uh, Bob Malley of Public Works, we've been working with the town attorney, and uh, we've drafted language uh, that is acceptable with some minor little tweaks. Um, but we got, we, I think we're, we're there as far as uh, acceptable language for a new easement that would run, would be 20 feet wide, it'd run back through here, it's this hatched area. Uh, it would run back, it would, it would, we would tie in the existing sewer line that comes out of uh, the uh, professional center and then, and then there's a stub that actually extends out and, and stops about right in here. The, the easement actually, you can see this line here, but that easement actually continues on and there's an existing easement on the abutting property here. The idea being that at some point in time, uh, there may be the potential to tie in some of the residents out on uh, Davis Point Road into the town sewer system. So uh, that's, that's one modification that that has been flushed out in a lot more detail than what was uh, presented last time. Second item is that um, in the previous plan, we've been using the, uh, the previous uh, existing conditions plan that was developed. It was, it was fairly old and it was, it was done for Rudy's and for when Joel kind of split off and developed this parcel in the, in the rear here. Uh, we found that there wasn't really it wasn't really showing exactly what had been happening over the past few years um, on Rudy's property, and it didn't have it, uh, enough information along Route 77 that we felt comfortable kind of grading and drain with grading and drainage. So we actually sent the surveyor out. They resurveyed this parcel. They resurveyed all of Route 77 from uh, Davis Point Road over to um, Two Lights Road, and uh, we now have a, a very good accurate account of what's happening out there and, and really what's happening from a drainage point of view uh, you have probably all noticed this but uh, this road is actually kind of super elevated whereas a, a typical road section would be a crown in the middle of the road and then it, it, it kind of pitches off on both sides in this situation because it's going around a corner uh, this road is actually higher on the on the outside of the curve than it is on the inside. So all of this water kind of drains directly across Route 77 and currently um, you know the edge of the existing kind of pavement is back in here somewhere and so it currently it just kind of all flows onto 
uh, Rudy's property and then kind of makes its way down to this wetland area. So uh, by picking up this additional topo information, we're able to kind of do a better job with kind of figuring out how to deal with the, uh, how to set the curb heights and the edge of the pavement and so forth along here. Um, and our civil engineer actually recalculated all of his stormwater calculations based on all the new topo and um, that revised stormwater uh, management plan is it was included in the application. Uh, the results of that are, are basically the same as before and that is there's a, there's a very minimal um, increase in stormwater. Um, the town engineer has reviewed his revised stormwater plan and um, it finds it acceptable. So basically what we're doing from a drainage point of view is we're, we're installing a curb that runs along the west side of Route 77 here and comes back across here again. Uh, that curb will kind of um, provide a separation between the pavement and a lawn grassed esplanade. It also collects and directs the water all down. It'll come across the entrance point here, come down, and there's a catch basin that's located right here, a new catch basin that'll be in the edge of the pavement. And from there, that, that water is discharged over into kind of the adjacent wetland area here. There's, and there's, uh, there's several sheets of drawings in the application that talk about kind of a level spreader and how we're dealing with uh, uh, dissipating the energy from that, from that stormwater uh, before it, it is allowed to seep back into the wetland area here. So that's the second thing that was modified and changed, and I think it's, it was definitely for the best. Uh, the third item, um, and it's in, identified here in red. Um, there was some discussion last time. We, we actually had the dumpster located back here. And there was a lot of discussion at the last meeting about whether the dumpster needed to be outside of the 100 foot or inside the 100 foot setback from the residential zone. Um, and so we took another look at it and we've actually relocated that dumpster to this location here in the, in the parking lot. So it's still, it's still a fairly reasonable uh, walking distance between the, the back of the Rudy's restaurant here and where the dumpster is. It's, it's pretty easily accessible by trucks. It uh, gets it away from this area and it's definitely outside of the, uh, the 100 foot setback. So we think that's a, that's a good modification that's occurred. Next item is the propane tank. Um, we originally had propane tanks located back here, and, um, and those, at the time, that setback was based on what the standard state code is for propane tanks. Um, and we came to find out that there's actually a portion of the ordinance in the, in the BA zone, I believe it is, BA design guidelines, that discuss a 75-foot setback from a property line for propane tanks. So, we kind of took a hard look and there's a very small window here and it's, and it's very tiny. I mean, these tanks just barely fit in there. Um, so we're, we are now showing those propane tanks being located in this location here. So it's a little bit further of a run for propane line uh, to the building, but um, we think it's, it's acceptable. And we, we think that uh, as far as filling goes, there's, you know, it's right along an aisle here. There's no parking that it's taking up. Uh, we're going to provide some protection here with some steel bollards and we're showing some planting around it. Uh, the one issue with this is that a portion of this propane tank area um, is located within the RP1 setback area. So that RP1 setback line is, runs right along here like this. There's about 200 and uh, I think it's 257 square feet of impact within that zone. It's not, it's not wetland impact, but it's impact within the buffer. And in discussing that with Maureen, um, utilities is an allowed use within the buffer area. So um, unfortunately, that's the only place on site that we meet the 75 foot setback from property lines. Um, the lighting plan, we, uh, we revised the lighting plan. We sent that off to the lighting engineers again and uh, we had a couple of small areas where the light level exceeded the half a foot candle um, at the property line and it was primarily at this entrance here and I guess at the time my thought was that 
you know, it's, it's probably more important to uh, light that entrance well than it is to meet the, uh, the town standard, but Maureen reminded me that uh, that town standard is there for a reason. So uh, we've revised the plan. Uh, there was a, a submittal of a new photometric plan that clearly illustrates that, uh, that all the lighting levels at the property line meet or exceed the town standard. Um, so what we have now, instead of, we had four poles out here, we had one, two, three, four. Now we've taken those four light standards and, and doubled them up on two poles here. So, so that really the lighting kind of does this and does this here. And uh, we're able to meet those standards in actually a more cost effective way. So uh, we think that's okay. Um, there was some discussion last time about buffering and primarily buffering kind of on the Davis Point Road end of uh, end of the site and um, so we took another look at that we've we've actually added several uh, evergreen trees in this area the trees we've selected are Serbian spruce and the reason for that is two one is that the, the spruce trees uh, maintain their branches down to the ground not like a typical pine where over years the, the lower branches tend to kind of die off and you lose that screening effect but with a with a spruce or a fir, uh, those those branches stay low and they they fill in very tightly and uh, form a dense screen. The other thing about a Serbian spruce, two other things. One is that they're very salt tolerant, so they're they're able to handle kind of any salt or sand or abuse kind of that uh, that would happen either from salt spray from the ocean or from uh, salting on the roads by the town crews. And the third is that they're, they're a fairly narrow tree and we've really only got uh, 10 feet to work with between uh, the property line and the building line. And so we can't really put a big evergreen in there like a Colorado blue spruce or um, balsam fir that's going to get to be you know 30 or 40 feet wide because um, it's then going to be impacting both Davis Point Road and also impacting our building. So we thought that, uh, that um, this, this narrower spruce tree would be an appropriate uh, plant material for this area. And we think that um, in combination with some shrub planting here, and we're, we're shrubbing up along the back of the property line here, you can see these are all plantings that were done as part of the adjacent development. So we're really reinforcing the planting that's already here. And I'd also like to point out that there's actually three existing shade trees on this side of Davis Point Road in the right of way. And there's actually four evergreen trees on this side and an eight foot fence. So we think, uh, we feel pretty strongly that given the existing fencing, the existing trees and the new proposed vegetation in this area that we've really uh, done a pretty effective job of, uh, of buffering the shoes. I'd also like to like to uh, comment. There were there were some comments from the public about uh, about how this this planting is perhaps less dense than it was in 2009 when we uh, first came through with our approvals. And you have to remember that in 2009, this was a parking lot. And so we were trying to screen headlights, we were trying to screen the noise, and trying to screen kind of the, the, uh, the dust and so forth, the activity that was occurring when this was a parking lot. Now we've, we've removed all the parking from here, and all the parking is back here. So in effect, you've got this landscape barrier or buffer, but you've also got buildings here that buffer all of this activity. And so given, given the landscaping and the buildings and the existing buffering that's in place, we think we've done a pretty good job of um, mitigating um, any activity on this site. Um, we also talked last time about a pedestrian easement. Um, this, the, this, in line, this double line in red here is a proposed pedestrian easement that would come in from the adjacent neighborhood here. Um, and uh, we're still working with Maureen and the town on the actual easement language. But that, that pedestrian easement would be built at some point in time, probably by the town or uh, some local group, 
that would that would then provide a connection um, through the woods here, and then out. Of, and this would be part of the easement language, but it would come out across the parking lot and then down onto this this roadway, the sidewalk here. Um, the sidewalk has been slightly modified. If you remember uh, the previous plan, we had we had this sidewalk tucked pretty close to the property line. It was right right against the property line all the way across here. And uh, we, we started looking at this for a couple of reasons. One was um, trying to minimize the impact on the wetlands over here. When this, when this walk was back over here, uh, we, were, we were impacting probably five or six or 800 square feet more wetland by, by pushing it in this direction. So we pulled it out along closer to the road here. And then we swept it back in, and then we brought it back out here because we were a little bit concerned that uh, the cross, if the crosswalk was back here, cars, people would have to be going between cars as cars are trying to pull out of here. Uh, and it's not quite as visible or safe than having the crosswalk out at the, uh, at the curb line. So we brought it out here, and then we swung the, road, swung the sidewalk back in and up and then made some connections here to both buildings. Um, and then finally, uh, in a conversation with Maureen um, earlier this week, uh, she had asked me about uh, defining a phase two boundary. And so we took a look at this. I know there's in the, in the application on sheet L4, I believe it is, there's a, there's a plan that shows what, what we intend to do as part of phase one as far as the planting and um, paving and, and treatment of this area here. But she wanted identified on a plan um, just where the phase one, phase two boundary was. And so we've taken this line that's a 100 foot setback line here. We've gone five feet off the property line, 10 feet off the property line here, and then down to the property line in the front. So that that means that all of this planting that goes in in phase one along Davis Point Road and all the planting that goes in phase one along the back of the property is all part of phase one and then anything inside of here would be loaned and seeded and um, at, at the time that phase two comes into play uh, the building would be built the additional landscaping in here would be done and these sidewalk the sidewalk connection would be made so that's the way we're kind of proposing proposing that. Um, uh, there, were, there were several, a couple of comments that came out, they were very minimal actually, that came out of um, Steve Harding's review for the, as a town engineer. And uh, we haven't incorporated those into the plans yet, but they're, they're minor little things like identifying a type of curb, uh, identifying a couple of spot grades and so forth. Uh, Maureen has picked up a couple of little typos in some of the notes. Um, all of that will be, you know, we're, we, we've agreed to all of those conditions and all those comments that uh, came out of both Maureen and, and the town engineer and um, we'll be more than glad to kind of revise the plans and submit final plans at the time that, uh, or prior to a building permit being, being taken. So lastly, I wanted to just discuss uh, several of the comments that have come out of the uh, from, come forth from the neighbors, and uh, a lot of which I've actually discussed already tonight, primarily buffering. Um, but I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork. I know they're going to have some more more comments, and I just hopefully uh, we can kind of keep the discussion moving in a forward manner. Uh, again, buffering. I think given given the the use that's now proposed here and the, the level of buffering that, that either exists or is proposed that I, I feel pretty strongly that we've done a pretty good job of, of um, mitigating that. Uh, there were some discussions about parking and um, I just want to kind of go through the parking numbers with you a little bit. Uh, we're, we're proposing a total of 39 parking spaces. And I think at the last meeting we had 40. Uh, we were made aware of, uh, of a condition in the ordinance that says that you can't have more than 10 spaces in a row without having an island, and a uh, landscape island, and, and we, couldn't, we couldn't make that work here without losing a space. So there's actually 
39 parking spaces in here. Uh, there's a total of 31 spaces that are required for both uh, the Rudy's restaurant and for the phase two retail. So we actually have an excess of eight spaces on site. Um, now the intent is that, um, you know, everybody knows that the, the higher volume of traffic that the restaurant gets is usually in the evening. And, um, you know, the retail space is probably going to be closed in the evening, so those spaces ideally could be used or shared by the, uh, by the Rudy's restaurant uh, staff or, or uh, customers. So I know at the last, you know, back in 2009 when we came through, I think there was a total of uh, 40 spaces that was, that was agreed to at that point in time. This is a new application, but clearly we're, we're well in excess of what, uh, what the code requires. The code requires um, a total of 31, we're at 39. Uh, we think that there's adequate parking on site. Uh, the parking will be paved. Um, it'll be striped, and so there shouldn't be any confusion or a loss due to kind of not knowing where parking spaces are. Um, you know, access in and out is very clean and, and uh, visible, and circulation through here really works very well. So we think that 39 spaces is, is actually more than adequate to meet the needs of the, of the uh, project. I want to talk a little bit about phase two. Uh, phase two, the rationale here, phase two is, is what is this small building here. It's, I think, 1,350 square feet or 1,240, I'm sorry. Um, it will be a retail use. And uh, I know there's been questions asked about what is it. Well, you know, we don't have a tenant, so we can't really say what it is, but we can say it's retail use. And I think that that's, you know, I think any retail center uh, goes through that. And what the retail use is when, when we find a tenant may not be what it is five years from then when that lease is in, up and another business moves in. So uh, retail is an acceptable use in, in this district. Um, it's not a huge use. It's 1,200 square feet. You know, we're looking at, uh, you know, potential tenants that might be something from you know, a small little gift shop to perhaps a little garden shop or a, I, I know Paul has thrown out maybe a yoga studio or it's something that's kind of a very kind of low impact on the neighborhood. Uh, something, you know, the, the hours on this are not going to be evening hours. Um, and, um, you know, part of the reason for phasing this is to avoid what happened on the building next door. Whereas Mr. Ingalls built this building it sat vacant for more than a couple of years, and um, you know it was it was not of much value to the town in that in that state. So until we have a tenant for this building, the idea is that we're going to go ahead and build this phase one, and that when a tenant comes forward or when they lock in somebody, the second building will be built, and so it'll be built and it'll be occupied. And I think there's some there's some real value in that, uh, rather than constructing something that's just going to set vacant. You know, I'd like to also remind the board that you know this is really other than the building behind us, and uh, perhaps the police station. This is really the first new commercial building in town in a long, long time. And I think it's something that is really exciting for the town. And I know that uh, Paul is, is very excited about this project. And, um, you know, we're, we're really looking forward on to, to making this into kind of a really great kind of center for, for the, this end of the Cape and, and their neighborhood. So um, as far as the buildings go, I'm going to let Phil talk about that a little bit. I just want to talk about two other things. One was um, there was a comment that I can't remember who it was asked about condensers. And um, um, we're, we haven't shown any condensers on here. We're not that far along in the design process for the, for the building to understand what those condensers are going to be. 
but I, I can say that uh, they will be, they will not be within the 100 foot setback. They'll likely be on, on the uh, service side of the building over here. And we're looking at, you know, this is a small, it's a residential scale building. So any condenser that we have is going to be more or less residential scale. It's probably not going to be much different than the air conditioning units you've got sitting in your backyard. So, you know, the, the new condenser units are all quiet. Uh, there will be kind of cowling and shielding and so forth to make sure that uh, they're, they're as quiet as possible. And um, it's just that at this point in time, we don't know where those condensers are going to be. But it's no different than a residential scale condenser. I'm, I'm not sure. And the last would be hours of operation. Um, I know there's been some discussion, a lot of concern by the neighbors here on hours of operation. I think Maureen at the last meeting indicated that there is already a procedure in place for those to notify neighbors of, or anyone of those extra days that the restaurant would be staying open. And, um, you know, I think the intent right now is that uh, you know, when the building is up and operating, it's going to be a 10 o'clock closing time, and uh, with those three three extra days of uh, uh, staying open till 11. We did have some discussion today. I know there's a condition that Maureen has kind of passed around to folks about um, not increasing the time of operation until all the improvements are made, and I think. Uh, we're in discussion with the code officer now about that, but I think at this point in time, um, you know, I think if if all goes according to plan, this project's going to go into construction this spring and um, be up and operating this summer, and uh, we don't have to really worry about things. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil, and he's going to kind of show you around the buildings a little bit, and um, then if there's some discussion, Unless you want to talk, you want if you have some questions now, we can do that. Can I just go ahead? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so on phase two, uh, you're uh, seeking approval for basically a category three occupancy. Yes. And when you did the parking calculation, uh, would that wouldn't change for any of the other categories, two or one, the, the lower category? not the higher categories. I haven't gone through that, but I know that, I mean, if there's, a, if there's a tenant that comes in that would change the use, I think we would still be required to meet the, uh, the parking requirement anyway. If I could help with a question. Yeah. Um, when the, the pyramid that you're referring to was set up, we did look at the parking demands, and generally, as you move up the pyramid, you have the same parking demand or less. I have a question um, related to something that you mentioned, Pat, was this additional um, condition of approval, which you've seen. I guess I don't understand it. No expansion of use, including seats, or expansion of hours until the approved site plan improvements for phase one have been constructed. Does that mean until you're done building the building? That's what it means, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I think what that says is that you know, because if we get approval tonight for 80 seats, Paul can't go into the existing Rudy's and add a bunch of tables and chairs in there. Gotcha. Um, or he can't all of a sudden be open until 10 o'clock or say he's going to be open until 11 on, on New Year's Eve. Oh. Until, okay. until all of these improvements are in place. Oh, so he's got a post, the current Rudy's has a posted hours of operation and it's shorter than what Rudy's yeah, we're trying, to you know, in, yeah, in the ordinance? Yeah, and I, this was oh. actually news to me too. Okay. So, um, but I think we're, we're okay with that. I, okay. Um, okay, thanks. Pat, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Quick question, it was in one of the letters um, on the buffering again. On the north side of the restaurant, mm -hmm. 
last month when you were in, you showed five plants under a window. On the oh, here. Yeah, and, and in the letter, just they have been removed from this plant. If you could maybe answer why they have been removed. Well, we just, you know, we took another look at kind of what what the planting here really wanted to do and you know the planting here really wanted to kind of emphasize this this entranceway um, over here wanted to emphasize kind of the the retail center we kind of felt like this is a really nice building elevation here and you know we weren't really trying to do foundation planting around the entire building uh, there's a really nice window here I think that window as you're coming down route 77 um, you know, is a nice beacon, mm -hmm. and um, you know, Phil will show you in the in the photos or in the uh, the slides of of the building here that you know this is really nice. You know, I, I guess I just didn't see a need to have to kind of wrap foundation planting around the entire building. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Those those shrubs that were there were not going to be tall enough to kind of block that window if that was part of what the comment was about. It was. It was never the intent to block the window. I have one exiting the car park showing sacks. Mm -hmm. Before uh, before that was before I saw that work, there was a, there was a view to the right which was obscured. Now you've added three or four trees in there. Um, will you not add it back the obscuring the traffic coming up? Well, I, I think, you know, we, there's, a, there's a note here. If you look at the plans, there's a note here that talks about uh, site. I, I know what you're talking about, but I want, I want to back into that. Um, there's a note here that talks about site distances in this direction and the, and the need to do some pruning and so forth to verify that, in fact, we have those site distances. So I think any planting that we do out here is going to be part of that verification. That um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that these trees that are planted here are not going to be blocking views from cars in this looking in this direction. Yeah, because it seems to me that you have to come out a little further now to see because of the angle of the uh, of the foot track. So you you might have to do that calculation again. Mr. Steinberg, yes. um, when we wrote the description of how to measure site distance. We were concerned that it would sometimes require the cutting down of large, tr mature, deciduous trees. When a lot of those trees, you just can kind of sit in your car and go like this, go like this, and you can see around them. So the description in the ordinance says that you can that a, a single trunk of a tree can be um, eliminated from the calculation of the view shed. So if you just got that one tree and you're just doing this, and you got it's three. Okay. Yeah, but they're spread over how many feet? They're probably 35 or 40 feet apart. Yeah, so they're spread over about 100 feet. All right. Well, maybe the geometry works. But I think you know there is there is um, verification that's that's going to occur prior to occupancy that that we have proper site distances. So that'll all be taken into account. I have a question. I have a question regarding the sewer easement. Mm-hmm. And. You've drawn the new, where the new easement's going to be, and it comes up and abuts with the existing easement. Yes. Are, is, are there going to be two easements, the existing easement and a new one, or are they going to be nope. combined in some way? No, nope. the, the, the existing easement will be um, removed. Okay. The new easement comes across, and there's a, there's a portion of an existing easement that, that already occurs on the abutting property. That still remains in place. We're not touching any of that. So all we're doing is tying in on our side, uh, but that'll all be new easement that comes through here, and the and the old easement will be kind of released. Okay, thank you, Adam. Could you just clarify what was the last comment regarding? I wasn't quite sure I understood that regarding occupying the building before. Was that something you said you were in negotiations with the code enforcement officer? I, I didn't quite understand what that. We're meant. trying to understand, kind of. According, and this came out today, according to um, Maureen, and I've been trying to discuss this with Bruce, um, the existing Rudy's is a grandfathered restaurant. Mm -hmm. And because it's grandfathered, it has the hours that, that it had when it was grandfathered or the hours that, 
it has to kind of adhere to. Okay. That's what that's what Maureen has indicated. Now, my interpretation, and I went through this with Maureen today, was that it says in the in the in the ordinance that a restaurant can stay open until ten o'clock. So, I guess you know I was. I guess I wasn't really understanding kind of the grandfather part of this, but. Um, okay, and there was nothing mentioned. Did you mention something? Maybe I misunderstood or I wasn't listening. Regarding the site work and the buffering and all, I mean, that's all going to be in place before this project opens, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and there'll be a performance guarantee that's, uh, that's put in place that uh, requires that all that be, in, be done and, uh, before any of that money is released. Do you have any objection on page L1, note number four? Would you object if um, that was changed, some of the language there, to read the proposed use of the phase one project is a restaurant for a total maximum seating of 80? Strike some of the language that's there in those notes right there? No, I think we, we talked about that last time, and, yeah. and we didn't pick it up. Maureen picked so, that up on that. So I mentioned that there were a couple of typos in here. So no problem with changing that. And how about the proposed use of the phase two project is a village retail shop. So we can change that wording on the phase one and then add the phase two. And yeah, I, I, village retail. I, I, village retail I, shop. I got that out of the ordinance. That's is that what shop? Is. Okay. I didn't yeah. know. I, I was That's wasn't how sure about shop, but uh, village retail is fine. the specific use category. Okay. That's fine. Okay, and then also, um, as you're cleaning up, note number, oh, is that 10? Okay, that's teeny tiny. Note number 10 on that same page should indicate that the total square footage of wetland to be altered is 2,502 square feet? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay to make those changes when? Yep. Okay. Those are fine. So can I turn it over to Phil? Or? I have one more question, although it may be more for Maureen. And you can tell me I'm totally out of line, because it's actually un uh, well, the, but the, the property line between the, the north side of Davis Point Lane and the residential district. Right here. Yes. According to the zoning ordinance under 1981, that should be a fairly major buffer zone. So, and I mean, all that's there now is the fence and those trees. And my, I'm concerned because it just seems like this little zone of buffering on this pro on, the, on the applicant's property is trying to do what really a big wide buffer should do. So I guess my question is why isn't there a big buffer there? That's what the planning board proved. That Davis Point Lane is, is a road. Um, it's been there for quite some time. It was rebuilt as part of the uh, Two Lights Professional Center project. And that's, and, and by the way, that is a private road that's owned by Two Lights Professional Center and others. So the current applicant before you has no legal rights that I'm aware of in the Davis Point Lane right away. So they, they would have to obtain permission to put any plantings in there. But that project was reviewed, and I believe one of the reasons they didn't put as much landscaping in there is because the applicant installed fencing um, on the north side to address the uh, butter's concerns. So I think the, the, the idea was this would be more like a boulevard with street trees lining it because the people on the uh, north side uh, obtained fencing. Anything else before Phil takes over? Okay. You ready? Yeah, show your I can, should I leave it in there? Or? Here's, let's do this. Let's take your information. Okay, throw it up there. Good.
just to update the board, the applicant originally had hoped to provide you with uh, rotating 3D exposure to the building, but we had a little problem with connecting the projector to the computer. So instead, he has created static views. So you still have most of what you're going to see. And if you do want to see the full fly around, if I can pull it out, it's just going to have to be hands up. Uh, but hopefully the images that I've, that I've created will be sufficient. All right, there's not major changes. Um, Excuse me, Phil, could you yes. introduce yourself for the record? Sorry, Phil Kaplan, Kaplan Thompson Architects. Uh, what you're going to see today uh, is very much what you saw last time. There are only minor changes uh, to the floor plan, uh, and virtually none to the elevations, but I'll address those as they come up. Same floor plan and two entries, the primary entry to the front of the building on the east side and on the south side is the second entry. Same screen porch and same number of seats inside, bars in the same configuration. The only slight changes have to do with the inner workings of the kitchen, which is a little bit in flux anyway, and I, th I think not really relevant at this point. Second floor has essentially stayed the same. Uh, the balcony has now made part of the office, where before it wasn't. That was a minor concern that was brought up on the sidewalk. The roof still has uh, solar panels, but they're the, no, the actual number of photovoltaic panels has not been determined. But there's plenty of room if we want to actually make this a net zero building, which would be pretty cool. The elevations are, are now dra drafted, but again, ostensibly the same. The lower portion is metal siding. There is clapboards. There are the hardy plank claps with a five inch exposure above that to the second floor. And three elevations also have a decorative shingle pattern in the top of the gable. So here's the east elevation facing the road. This is the rear elevation. Here we see the screen porch elevation to the south. There's the solar panels. And this was a little unclear last time, so we provided two different elevations that would show what the north elevation of the building would look like in phase one and what it would look like in phase two. So maybe now it's a little bit more sense why we're putting a little bit more energy and fenestration on this edge and the east edge of the, of the north side. Okay. Wait, Pete, what, what, what is uh, your steep slope there? Is it still 12 12? Oh, the steep slope is still 12 12, yes. 12, 12, and it's a 4 and 12. Okay, let's move pets out of the way. Hmm, that's not a good sign. going to walk you through these manually one by one here. Uh, so here's essentially a view from the, the northeast, which you'll actually never see unless you can float. <laughs> uh, but it gives you a sense of the overview of the, of the building. Here's we move around a little bit closer to the, to the front entrance of the building. And you can see the in, uh, intended transparency of the structure that we really wanted to make it feel light. We wanted it to feel active. And the scale is very different toward the south end. This is where we're going to see the most foot traffic. So even though there's a two-story gable, 
we wanted to bring this down to about 11 feet at the edge of that eave. We're looking at the front door, back of the parking lot. Here, we're stepping back a little bit. You can see the south side, and you can see the primary. Entry. Is this color scheme accurate? Um, what I would say is that it's the intent that it, it will be very close to this. We haven't picked a specific color, but I can discuss general palettes, and I've got some samples. Here we turn a little bit more to the back side of the structure. And you can see how it resolves with the roof line aligning with the roof line of the first building. Again, a clear hierarchy between the two, the primary structure and the secondary structure, the future structure. This is a close-up. This is where you're going to be waiting for your name to be called. Pick up your pizza to go. And the intent is to have some exposed structure, both inside and out. Here, another view through the screen, screen porch as you enter, looking to the right. It's a quick peek inside. Sort of roughed out at the moment. But you can see when you walk in and turn to the right, here's the, here's the intended takeout area. And you get a sense of the flow through this place. This is a direct flow from the front door to the back door. Turn to your right, there's your screen porch. You turn to the left, there's the takeout. And you can see the booth beyond. Again, a very transparent, inviting, bright building. That's the intent. So we'll have a peek at the booths. There's a view from the screen porch out into the parking area. Okay, so here we step back a little bit. This is something that Pat, Pat was referencing before. I can get a little closer on the next shot as well. But this gives you a sense of, of again, the, the hierarchy of the two buildings. Essentially our primary building and the secondary building that is phase two. So you see the repeated gable forms primary, secondary. This is the feature that, was, that we had discussed before, the balcony that's actually on the north side. And the site doesn't reflect the updates to the site plan, right? It does, to some extent. Now, the, I have to say that the, the planting is, is not exact, and we don't have the curving road on here. As, as, as Pat has revised, so I would actually take those with a bit of a grain of salt. This is more the view that you would actually see. kind of a nice shot because you see the generous esplanade that Pat's created. Here's a view from the back side of the structure. And the attempt to, uh, attempt to again bring that scale down 
and align those roofs from the back side. And again, the front entry. Now, uh, one of the questions was about the siding. So I brought samples of the, the Hardy panel, but I honestly don't think anyone's that interested, and I think everyone's seen that before. The questions had to do with the, the, the lower siding, what we were proposing for the metal siding. So I brought a, a couple samples. Uh, when you ask for a sample, they don't let you choose the color. So this is not the color that we are proposing. We haven't picked out a color. But again, the palette that's shown is the intent. And there are samples that we have gotten that do show the colors. Now, I'll be happy to pass this around. What it is, it's, it's an aluminum siding. Uh, the intent is that it's going to be placed vertically. There are several dis different gauges. This is a 0 0.032. It also comes in a 0.04 and a 0.05. Uh, in my opinion, this is plenty tough for uh, the use that we're going to be needing. There's not, it's not a high traffic area. It's not a car wash. It's not going to be people really beating up against it. But we do want a tough material for what it is. It has a high recycled content, uh, between 80 and 85 percent, and it's 100 percent recyclable. It's much tougher than any any wood product than we than we would be able to put at that level. Uh, one of the other concerns was that, uh, and this comes from the the ordinances is essentially there's a concern that this is a cheap product. Uh, so I want to put an end to that. This is not. This is a high-end product, and it should not be considered a cheap product. There are concealed fasteners. Uh, it's tougher again than wood. It's durable. It's got a kynar finish, which is a baked-on finish uh, that you see very often in high-end windows. So it's guaranteed not to fade for I think the number is about 30 years. It's pr pretty tremendous stuff, and for that you pay a premium. Uh, for just to, to give the board a, a sense of cost, uh, wood siding per square foot is about three dollars and thirty cents to four dollars a square foot. The aluminum siding that we're proposing, with an anodized finish, is about five and a quarter a square foot. So there is a, an increased cost to this, but because of the durability and the appropriateness of this in a commercial structure. And, and frankly, the, the look of this, we feel it's the right thing to do. If the board's interested, here's a, a couple more samples that, were, that would be more akin to what we're proposing. That red. For color? Yes. Color. Yes. Our color, as I understand it, is not specifically part of the discussion. We are offering that to some extent. Can they answer any specific questions about the architecture of the building? I have a question. Can you go to a front view that shows both uh, buildings? Yes. see it, but is there a reason on the right-hand building mm -hmm. it's, you're slightly off-center, but not really employing an asymmetric organization there? Hmm. Interesting question. Good one. Very perceptive. I actually wondered if anyone was going to pick up on it. Of course, you've been an architect. Did. Well, I, it's very minor, the reason why we did that. And it's really just to cut the distance from walking from the parking lot. It's really that simple. And it was enough off-center that it felt like it was okay. If it was slightly off-center, then I think it would look weird. So it's, it's more of a one-third, two-thirds sort of game that we're playing. Any other questions? Thank you. to the public hearing portion of our evening. 
Before we open the public hearing, I just want to ask that anyone who wishes to speak, could you please come to the podium, state your name and your address, and for all who would like to speak, would ask that you create a line at the podium so that uh, there isn't a lot of downtime waiting for people to shuffle back and forth. And uh, there is a maximum limit of uh, three minutes for comments. So with that, I'll open the public hearing. And anyone wishing to speak, please come forward and uh, state your name. My name is Ronnie Jordan. I live at 5 Davis Point Lane. Would it, would it possible to go back to the site plan? Concerns is the traffic. Uh, I've lived at 5 Davis Point Lane for the last 27 years, and I know coming out of my driveway, I used to be driving now the road, uh, looking to the, see the last tree on the left in the front uh, of the uh, site plan? That's about the visibility you have right now to see a vehicle coming. I can't, you can't see a vehicle beyond that point. Even though the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, most people, you know, big body, 25 miles an hour through here. Many times I pulled out and almost I've got hit because I didn't see the car coming the other way. And with those trees there, it's even going to make it worse, I think. I think that's something that you should take into consideration. Uh, uh, I know they look nice, but the visibility is going to be uh, reduced. Uh, the other concern I had was the... Um, the closing at 11 o'clock, uh, I know the, the good table is, um, is open to 10, I believe, and at night you can hear them closing up, it's noisy. And I, if people, if the closing time's at 11, you know people aren't going to be out there until 11.30. Uh, I just think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be noisy for the neighbors. Um, right now, Rudy's is 9, it's not too bad, but... Uh, I think 11 is stretching it. Uh, now, the proposed retail building, <laughs> you said that it's going to be probably closing at 5. Is that going to be something that's going to be mandatory if, if it's going to be a, a condition of using that building? Because if it closes in later than that with the restaurant open and the retail, I don't think, I think the park is going to be overflow, overflow parking, which probably will go on to Davis Point Lane or into the professional building parking lot. Uh, I think that's a, you know, it's a concern. And finally, I just the uh, uh, the easement is that was that a condition of the, the site being approved? The easement to the pond? It wasn't. Are we talking about the sewer easement? Easement to the Great Pond. No, it's not. A it's not never. Excuse me. It's never been discussed as a condition of approval. Okay. Because I know it's Golden. been. It's been. The, the applicant has been requested, and they could have declined it, and they'd still be before the board. Okay. They, it's it's a voluntary thing on the applicant's part. Yeah. I know that because um, I know people walk over my property as it is going down there, and um, I'm afraid it'll make it even worse. So, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Morris Kreitz. I live at 524 Ocean House Road. Um, I do have concerns about the planting buffer and about the parking that I've, that I've gone into some detail about in my letter to you, so I'm not going to talk about that this evening. Um, I'd like to talk about something a little more general. Uh, I think that what's happening here with the Rudy's site um, indicates that the BA zoning that was recently adopted by the town is really not appropriate 
for this area, uh, for the Ocean House Road business zone. The already, uh, the former Rudy site has been split in half and that quite large professional building has been constructed. Uh, now we're looking at having two more buildings constructed. Uh, so on a plot that used to hold a small convenience store, we're now looking at three substantial buildings. We're looking at parking for 60 cars. And even this um, isn't going to be the end of it. Uh, the, the land to the west of the professional building, uh, which is off the top of the site plan that's up on the wall here, is also in the BA zone. Uh, so we can anticipate, uh, since this seems to be becoming a hotbed of, of activity in town, that there may be businesses back there as well, leading to even more traffic uh, and even more congestion, even more noise in our neighborhood. More specifically, um, uh, I understand that the BA zone is in place, um, and I'm whistling in the wind here, but um, I just needed to say that. More specifically, uh, the phase two building here, the retail zone, uh, the, the, the retail building, uh, Pat Carroll has, has said that, he's pointed out that this is the first retail, uh, new retail space being proposed for the town in quite a while, and he's quite excited about it. Uh, I'd be more excited about it if it were happening in the town center. Um, where I would expect to find retail in town. Um, more specifically still regarding the phase two building, um, I see that, that the developer is leaving his option open to subdivide the property. He's left 10 feet or so between the two buildings so that he can slide a property line in there at some later date if he wants to and break off the retail building um, uh, to be a separate site. Um, that seems crazy to me uh, out in the area where I live where uh, it's really pretty rural. It seems crazy to me that there are no minimum property sizes at all specified in the BA zone. Uh, as an example, this phase two building on its 6,000 square foot lot, if in fact it is divided off, will exist with, with no on-site parking. Um, it, it just strikes me as being absurd that, that this kind of density of development is being uh, permitted and encouraged out uh, on, on in this neighborhood, out by Broad Cove Road. Um, I appreciate the chance to vent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm Joseph Foley, 511 Ocean House Road. I live behind the fence. I didn't realize the fence was going to be a topic of discussion tonight, but I'll give you a little history. The fence on the front part of our property was constructed and paid exclusively uh, by myself and Gail Schmader. It had nothing to do with the Two Lights Professional Center. The plantings that uh, Mr. Shallot mentioned, uh, those pertained to that prior development. Three sections of fence in the backyard were part of that prior development, that's it. The rest of the fence was for ourselves, for our privacy, because <clears throat> we felt that the prior buffering was totally inadequate. And uh, 
So here, we're here tonight to talk about this development and the buffering, particularly along Davis Point Lane, that separates us from these proposed two new buildings. Um, the prior site plan back in 2009, 2010, had substantially more buffering, and we would like to see that put in place for this particular plan. What Mr. Carroll has proposed, in our opinion, is not adequate, and uh, we would like to see additional buffering put in there. And uh, when the prior plan was approved, 2009, 2010, there was a 100 foot setback area between the building at that time and any parking and uh, the residential property line and all the buffering was to help provide sound and lighting and I see no reason why to change it at this time. I think it should be even more so as the building's closer to us and the phase two building is going to be right on top of us. Uh, I would also like to talk about the condenser. Um, I find it hard to believe that they don't know where they're going to put it, but I'm very concerned about where it's going to be and uh, whether or not it's going to have some sort of shielding on it. <clears throat> I'd also like to talk about hours of operation. And it's my understanding currently Rudy's can only stay open to 9 o'clock. Prior operators of Rudy's seem to have a problem with telling time. And so uh, we can say this about the new operator, that they appear to be closing at 9, as they're required to. Uh, once a new building is constructed and everything for the restaurant is outside of the 100-foot setback, then they can stay open till 10 o'clock. With three nights a year, they can stay open to 11. There is no notification in place that I'm aware of that would notify any of the neighbors when these three nights are going to be. So just to make sure that everybody understands <clears throat> when they are and we don't have any unnecessary calls to the police or the code enforcement officer, I would encourage you to put in place a notification system that all neighbors within 500 feet should be notified at least seven days in advance of when these three nights are going to be. Uh, as far as phase two is concerned, um, I'm just going to echo some of the concerns that the previous speaker spoke about, that this is a large building on a very small piece of land that overwhelms, and it's not compatible with the neighborhood, and not compatible to uh, what the VA zoning regulations are put in place for. I'm concerned about parking on Davis Point Lane, parking in front of our house, parking behind our house, parking on Route 77. I'm concerned about noise that will come from it. I'm concerned about the hours of operation. And I truly believe that putting any building within 100 feet of the residential property line violates what the spirit and the intent of that 100-foot setback was put in place for. So I would encourage you to table and postpone any decision about phase two. And let's just concentrate on the Rudy's buildings because I think we all can agree what's there now is not something that we like to look at and enjoy. And we really would like to see a new building as long as it's compatible with the neighborhood. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Katie Fairbanks Cliff, 82 Ocean House Road, and I'm the manager at Rudy's. I need my glasses. I'm here tonight to encourage you to pass the new Rudy's design. It is a vast improvement over the old Rudy's. As much as we love the old Rudy's, she has not aged gracefully. The new design provides a beautiful setup for the area. The landscaping and parking layout is a huge improvement over the current conditions. I also believe a huge amount of effort has gone into the accommodations of all the neighbors and there's concerns. Equally important, it gives me and my 11 fellow employees a job. All of us worked under the former tenant and we all now work under Paul. When he bought Rudy's, he could have closed it down, but he didn't. He could have closed it down while waiting for all of this approval, but he didn't. 
He painted it, he cleaned it up, he kept us all employed. He did it because he understood what we told him about it. It is part of this community. On a Friday night, you'll have a group of teenagers eating a pizza before going to a game. They'll be sitting next to the lovely Mayberries and Mrs. Leon, who just celebrated her 88th birthday with us last Saturday. The middle school football team has a pizza party before their banquet. We sit amongst the local firefighter, farmers, doctors, lawyers. We all are there. We are a part of this community. We will all be there when the new Rudy's opens. We, the people, are the pe we, the employees, the people who are regulars, we make up Rudy's. We will be hiring high school kids, we'll be hiring college kids, and moms like me who have kids in college. All of this for this beautiful building, I think simply, is just best for the cake. Thank you. My name is Gail Schneider. I live at 511 Ocean House Road. Um, I appreciate much of what's been done with this plan. I think it's a vast improvement over what's there. I certainly appreciate the relocation of the dumpster, which just has come about. Um, I think that's a nice improvement. I do have a few things that continue to concern me. The first one has been mentioned by a number of people, and that is the buffering along Davis Point Lane. Um, I think it's still very limited. I think it's a, a very large building that's being placed almost adjacent to a residential neighborhood with relatively limited buffering. It's only a 10-foot wide sector there. There are five Serbian pine trees slated to go in there, and I believe there's also one dogwood up towards uh, Route 77. The Serbian pines, as noted, are tall, slender trees. Um, upon some research, they also are noted as slow-growing trees. So in order for that to provide some buffering that would be um, dense or provide a solid buffering, it will take many, many years for that to fill in. I would ask you to please require substantial year-round, fast-growing, dense foliage. I really think there's improvement that can be made in that section. The other item under buffering that concerns me is the buffering that was slated under the north side of the building, under the restaurant window there. Um, I understand why it has been decided not to do it now. I, do, I don't agree with it. Um, Maybe when phase two is built, there will be some visual break there, but until phase two is built, it's a very stark facade that faces our neighborhood. And I really think that putting those um, low bushes along the foundation there would do much to make it a more pleasant um, facade for us to look at. Another concern remains the siding. I see the siding that was passed around. I don't agree that that's compatible with what is in the neighborhood. I don't see any other building close by whatsoever that has that kind of siding. My understanding is that this building needs to be compatible with the buildings around it. Um, color isn't noted. We did bring that up. At the, I understand it was discussed at the site walk. I, I'm disappointed that the color hasn't been chosen at this point. Hopefully it will be compatible with the neighborhood. I also remain concerned about the overflow parking. It's lovely to see so many parking spots, especially well marked and tarred or paved. I am concerned about the, um, the, um, the trucks, the pickup trucks that come in with trailers. Where will they be parking? I'm concerned that they might be forced out onto the street and possibly along Davis Point Lane. The bike lane in this area is a highly used bike lane. Any parking in the bike lane will, I totally believe, will be a safety concern for the high use in this area. Uh, we see it at all times of the day and night. Um, people biking, walking, running, um, baby carriages. To put cars, to force cars out onto the street, I think is a very, very unsafe situation. I understand it can't happen in the BA zone, so does that push it out into the residential areas? Um, I know that in other plans there was overflow parking arrangements made with St. Bartholomew's Church. I haven't heard any more about that for this particular project here. 
The last thing I'd like to comment on is phase two. I t really totally believe that it is too much in too little space. Um, I do not believe that it encompasses the intent of what the BA zone was meant to be. It's not the downtown business zone. It's a small BA zone abutting residential neighborhoods. Thank you, and thanks for giving us a chance to speak. Good evening. My name is Carl Best. I live at 12 Pondu Road. Um, my property abuts Davis Point Road. Um, basically, everything that I wanted to comment on has already been said, um, but I think it bears repeating. Um, I, too, am pretty, uh, pretty pleased with some of the changes that uh, the architect, Mr. Carroll, has made, um, especially with the dumpster. Um, I do have a question pertaining to the rear lighting in the two buildings proposed, and, uh, you know, maybe someone can can uh, fill me in there and how intrusive that may or may not be with, uh, with the neighbors, of which I am one. Um, I would hope that uh, the applicant, uh, in terms of buffering, would, would make a, an effort equal to that of the, of the neighbors. You know, we've put up fences, things of that nature, to, to maintain some semblance of privacy. Um, that, that's just a real big factor and in my chief concern. Um, as well as parking on Davis Point Road. I'm a little skeptical that overflow parking may actually occur at, at St. Bart's, and, and frankly, I'm not even sure if that conversation has been had or any arrangements have been made, but um, this is what I've heard. Uh, I, I fear that some people may take advantage of Davis Point Road, which would bring them in very close proximity uh, to my home, and just the thought of uh, the added traffic and noise uh, that late at night um, you know, I'm sure you'd agree. It's uh, it's not uh, not something I care to really to really have. Um, and uh, you know, lastly, I couldn't help but uh, make mention of the fact uh, the gentleman spoke earlier about uh, this development. And when I might drive over here, I was thinking the current project proposed and the development being what it is in that area. Um, I'm wondering, are, are we poised to make this the new town center? Um, the big question mark is what's coming down the road after this. Um, I, I hope we'll, uh, we'll plan appropriately. Thanks. Hi, my name is Natalie Deschino. I'm the owner at, of the professional building at to Davis Point Lane. And I'm very pleased with the uh, proposed plans. I only have some concerns uh, with the buffering between the two properties. I think we've worked really hard at finding some good tenants for uh, our units and they're very quiet and they're concerned about noise. And with the entrance the way it's proposed to be, I think a lot of the noise in the evening will be in that corner and I wish uh, there could be a little more buffering uh, around there so those units upstairs uh, won't have to, to hear that that noise in the evening because it does get a little noisy when people exit the restaurant right now so if the way it's proposed to be if there were a little more buffering there I think it would be it would be great anyone else wish to speak okay the uh, public hearing portion of the meeting is now closed and we'll go on to the discussion by the board anybody have any Questions, comments, thoughts? I have a question for Maureen. Um, as I read the ordinance, it seems like there's um, a more stringent buffering requirement with um, different adjacent uses, um, so residential to commercial. What is the official use of the um, professional center? Is it multi-use? Is it it's non-residential? It's a combination of office and residential. And so how would that fit in? Um, well, office and residential are it, both permitted uses in the BA district. Right. And restaurant is a permitted use in the BA district. OK. Because so the ordinance that. talks about buffering of adjacent uses where there is a transition from one type of use to another. Right. Would this I, be one I would type suggest of use that to office another? and and restaurant are extremely similar uses. So you, you don't think it's like that. That's, that was my question. 
I guess I have one. It's technical, I guess. In phase two, the segment of that land, could it be split off from the other one? In other words, become two different owners? And would the buffering between those two buildings be sufficient? Well, the only time you get to look at buffering is when uh, a review is triggered. Right. So if site plan or subdivision review is triggered, then you get to look at buffering. And uh, in the application that I'm seeing before you, I think there is a potential for phase two to be divided off as a separate lot. And I'm not convinced that the code officer would consider that enough of a trigger to call it an amendment to the site plan and send it back to the planning board. Which is why I had suggested that, um, at a minimum, that I think you've got a potential condition of approval for me that talks about, mostly it's about the, 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 two, uh, the two areas are very codependent right now. Right. And I believe that it would be possible to break off a separate lot for phase two from phase one, as long as you preserved their codependency in deed restrictions. Okay. So for example, um, this condition says that if you were to create a separate lot for phase two, there would need to be easements that allow phase two to use the parking on the old lot one. There would be easements that would be required uh, to share the utilities, the sewer line that goes from one lot to the next lot. Um, and there would be uh, probably, I'm guessing there might be some other easements, there would be an easement for vehicular access because right. you would rather, because I know you're a great supporter of access management, that you wouldn't want to see a, a, a new driveway so close to Davis Point right. Road going from the new phase two lot to Ocean House Road. You would want that to be maintained as the only access coming off of the phase, the phase one lot. And then uh, there are, oh, and I'm going to look at Pat for this, but I do, re I do remember seeing two water supply lines and then a third single fire line going in between the two buildings, which made me think that potentially the fire line was going to be shared by both buildings. Mm -hmm. And that would be another occasion where some kind of utility easement sharing between the two would need to happen. So just to clarify, if it were subdivided, it would be subject to site plan review, and then the... No, that's not what I, what I said. Oh. Is I have no confidence oh. that if they were to create another lot, that the code enforcement officer would consider that enough of a change that it triggered an amendment to the previously approved site plan. So that's why I'm suggesting that, at a minimum, if there was any division, I think that a requirement that certain easements be exchanged between the two lots to preserve these other elements that are part of your site plan should occur. It'd be built in beforehand. Right? Built in beforehand, right. Any other? That's going to be tough to word. Actually, I have drafted you a condition 3.1 if you wanted to use that or start with that as a base. And I do have one other question, which was regarding the access coming out of Davis Point Road. Um, I think the access coming out of there and having to turn south would be possibly a problem with some of the trees we've got in there again. Do we have enough, do we have enough room on that or is, is there something that, you're coming down from Davis Point Road, you want to turn south, You've got to try, cross over the traffic. Um, you've got to be able to see. When, when Davis Point Road was, was approved as an access point for the Two Lights Professional Center, the sight distance in both directions was approved by the planning board. Right. Now, I suppose you could ask the applicant as a condition of approval to verify that the proposed street trees are going to um, compromise that sight distance. I have no expectation that they will. Okay. That's fair. Any other questions? Yes. Can I actually respond to some of the comments that were heard more than questions? Because um, I've read it in a couple of letters and then it was brought up again. Um, Pat did touch on it about those hours and wanting to be notified beforehand. I just wanted to point out that there's actually a section in the ordinance to be real specific, 19-6-5 DJ2, and it says, 
An establishment may remain open to customers as late as 11 p.m. for up to three evenings per calendar year if the owner provides at least seven days prior notice to the code enforcement officer of the date of the late night e event. So it's, it's in there. So you will have a point person. There is somebody that's going to have that seven-day prior notification and somebody who will be tracking that it has to occur no more than three times. So I just wanted to point that out. Well, it's an enforcement issue with the code enforcement officer. If I can just, yeah. I know that was like sort of a random, I might have heard a comment from the audience um, that asked how the, the, the abutters would be notified for those three late nights. And I, I mean, I think most of you were participating in when the BA district rules were rewritten. They were, oh, they were, they were very heavily scrutinized. The council had more than one workshop where they wrote these these provisions. And the council decided that they didn't want to put in a specific provision requiring abutters be notified of these three late night events. So there is nothing in the ordinance that requires that abutters be notified. I believe that the notification to the code officer was put in here so that an applicant, uh, excuse me, that uh, a property owner couldn't say, oh, this was the first night I was open till 11 when other people may have said, gee, they seem to be open by 11 all the time. So it was really put in there as an enforcement action rather than uh, a routine notification to uh, residents. And this was a decision made by the people who adopted the ordinance. And um, there was also the concern about the parking in Davis Point Lane or any parking in, on the bike path or in the professional building. Um, as you know, you can't park in the bike lane. You can't. If they don't want you to park on Davis Point, if that owner doesn't want, I mean, these, these go back to enforcement issues. These aren't really issues that I was able to find anything in the ordinance or the code that we could stipulate. So I wanted to point that one out too, because um, that one keeps coming up about the parking. Um, there was, uh, someone mentioned uh, the rear lighting, a concern about that rear lighting. Um, I saw in the plans where the lighting limits have been met so that should not be an issue either. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of those items that tend to be enforcement or there is something in the code or, or is lacking. Thank you. Anybody else? I, mean, I, just have a, I just have a general question that the audience might be interested to know the answer to too, and that is that the professional building, was that um, approved before or after the BA district um, ordinance was rewritten? It was approved before. So, the, I mean, the, I was hired in 1990, and this was zoned BA when I was hired. So it's been a business district for a long time. The separation of the two lots uh, with the old Rudy's was done under the old regulations. The approval of the Two Lights Professional Center was done under the old regulations. Thanks. Anything else? So, where are we going from here, guys? I, I just want to say I think it's a great plan, and um, we're really lucky that the planning, the members that sat on the planning board before us wrote the BA regulations with um, these design standards. We recently approved something that didn't have design standards, and I think the plan suffered as a result. And um, I think the applicant has gone above and beyond their duty in terms of um, where they placed the building in the parking lot. In my estimation, it would make a lot more sense to put the parking lot closer to the residences. I think that the applicant has done a good job moving the, the dumpster, um, has taken detail with the lighting plan, has beefed up the buffering in response to um, some comments. And the fact that they're providing, potentially going to provide a pedestrian easement to connect the abutting neighborhood to the Great Pond area is really magnificent. And um, it not only is it an improvement to what is there now, but they've really gone beyond what the, what the ordinance asks them to do. And I understand that um, residents are concerned 
And to the extent that there are issues with parking um, or hours, I would encourage the residents to call the police or call the um, code enforcement officer or put up signs about parking. But that's really outside of the purview of this project. And um, I, 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 I would, I want to make a motion to approve it. I, I think we're lucky that the applicant is spending this much money on such a nice plan. I have one comment. I, I think the plan is good. It looks very nice. It's certainly a great improvement over the, would be, will be a great improvement over the existing building. I think the only comment I have is about the metal side. Um, I was thinking about noise, and metal doesn't tend to absorb noise. It tends to reflect it. So wood tends to absorb it. Any softer material tends to absorb it. So I wonder if, in actual fact, you're sending out n noise or amplifying it rather than absorbing it. That's just a query about the siding. Do you like to respond? Please. Um, well, I, I, I guess it's sort of an abstract answer that I'm going to give. I can't specifically give you the, the, the sound transmission coefficient of the siding. I will tell you that a couple things happen when you have a corrugated siding that it actually diffuses the noise because of the shape of the siding as opposed to a, 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 a solid piece of metal. So it changes the sound, but it, it's going to reflect it, correct? I mean, it, it changes the frequency or it, models the frequencies, but, um, but in actual fact, that's still reflecting. It, it would, yes. And aluminum is a softer material than steel, for instance. And, uh, and I, again, I, I can't give you any measurements but because of the, the profile of the siding and the fact that and the question is what is that exactly going to hit it in a vertical surface and how often may hail come down at an angle that at that one time of the year going to affect people who are going to be inside their homes. No, and this, I, is, this is yeah. a siding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it, I guess you could affect it with the volume of the paint that you put on it or the surface. It's a softer surface, it won't resonate so much. I think there, there might be some difference, it may be slight, but I don't, I don't know the specific answer, but that might be the case. So it's just a point that you know, okay. it might have an effect. Thank you. Anything else? No other questions? Do I hear a motion? I would first of all like to say that I would like to see um, the, the proposals that we, we received a, let, uh, a note from this morning. I don't think I have it in front of me. Ah, thank you. Oh, oh, there you go. I've got two of them now. The, uh, that we, the potential additions of some conditions of approval. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read them out or would you, or you accept what's on the paper? Mm -hmm. no, we'll read them out when we... Okay. When we include okay, them, right, we'll include them with the motion right, when yeah, it's made you, in its entirety. So, Joe, you're going to do the motion? Motion. <laughs> motion for the board to consider finding a fact. 517 Ocean House LLC is requesting site plan review and resource protection permit to construct an ABC restaurant and second 12. 150 square foot retail building, including 2,738 square feet of wetland alteration to construct a sidewalk in the Business A District located at 517 Ocean House Road, which requires review under Section 19.9, Site Plan Regulations, and Section 19A3, Resource Protection Permit Regulations. Um, the town engineers identified revisions needed to the plans. The applicant will be re okay. Okay. the applicant will be relocating an, exist an existing sewer line and will also need to relocate the corresponding sewer easement. The application substantially complies with section nineteen nine site plan regulations. Therefore be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of 517 Ocean House LLC for site plan re review 
and a resource protection permit to construct a DEC. Restaurant and a second 1,250 square foot retail building, including 2,738 square feet of wetland alteration to construct a sidewalk in the Business A district located at 517 Ocean House Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated December 13, 2011. Two, that the applicant provide a letter from the Portland Water District confirming an adequate supply of water for the proposed project. Three, that the applicant provide sewer easement in a form acceptable to the town attorney and all acceptable to the town manager. And four, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised per the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review and a performance guarantee has been provided in accordance with section 19-9-4B3. All right, and then we're adding all of these. Yes. All right, uh, additional conditions of approval, 3.1. That if a second lot is created for any portion of phase two, the lot division include the exchange of easements from lot one to the new lot two to accommodate parking and vehicle access for lot two on lot one and reciprocal utility easements, including but not limited to sewer easements and possibly water supply easements. 3.2, that the site plan be amended to show a boundary for phase two located on the setback lines for the west and north side of the lot property boundary for the east side of the lot and an appropriate boundary between the two proposed buildings on the south side of phase two. 3.3, that a note be added to the plans that there be no expansion of use, including added seats, until the approved site plan improvements for phase one have been constructed. Or expansion of hours. I think you missed the line, or expansion of hours. Yep. Sorry, I missed that line, or expansion of hours until the approved site plan improvements to phase one have been constructed. Do I hear a comment? Comment, go ahead. Um, I would like to add two more. Um, that note number four on page L-1 read, the proposed use of the phase one project is a restaurant for a total maximum seating of 80. The proposed use of the phase two project is a village retail shop. Another amendment that says the note uh, on number 10, note number 10, same page, be changed to indicate that the total square footage of the wetland to be altered is actually 2,502 square feet. And that would also mean that the numbers we're using here in the finding of facts, we should all be saying that the, um, the second phase two building is actually 1,240 feet and that the uh, retail building uh, would include 2,502 square feet of wetland alterations. So that would meet the finding of facts and also in the, um, the motion. Those numbers need to be changed. So do we approve second motion and then amend it? Well, I think what you want to do is there needs to be a second to these the, the motion. Well, first of all, I think you're making recommendations to change a motion that hasn't been seconded yet. Oh, so okay. the proposer of the motion could accept those as friendly amendments. Okay, I'll accept them. Okay. So now you have a, a one motion, and it, it now needs a second. I second. Thank you. <laughs> now we can talk about one more. Oh. Um, the only thing that I, I would suggest is that we renumber them so that uh, the issuance of the building permit becomes the last the last condition of approval, which would make that number eight. And I, the only reason I say that is because it, it says, it refers to the above conditions, per the above conditions. So I want to make sure all conditions precede this. Uh, 
five, six, seven, three, three, six, seven. So you need a second on that. Yes. So if anyone I'll second that. Thank you. <laughs> and then the we proposer, haven't voted on then the proposer of the original motion and the seconder of the original motion have to be willing to accept that as a friendly amendment. Well, yes. You have to be, you have to accept it, Joe. <laughs> so, all right, so that's all. Is that all clear as mud there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, any, any other discussion? Any comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Zero opposed. Six in favor. Thank you very much. All right, I need my agenda back. Where is it? All right. Oh, thank you. Anyone want to make another motion? Make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Am I allowed to do that? No. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Nice job, Carolyn. <laughs> we have a motion. I'm sorry. It's just that.